It is good to see all of you. Uh, I'm excited to dive in the word with you guys today. It has been quite a while since I've had the opportunity to explore the scripture with you guys. I think, I was trying to remember, the last time I preached was the Sunday after Christmas. So it's been a little bit for me uh, with you guys. So I'm excited to be diving in today with you. Speaking of the word, we are going to be diving deep into the Bible today. So if you are here or you're watching online, I would invite you to uh, grab a physical Bible if you have one or use your phone. The uh, scripture will be on the screen, but we're going to be skipping through some things. And if you want full context for what we're doing, I think you'd be well served to have a Bible. So I'll be using the New International Version, which is also what's on the pews here in the church, or you can follow uh, with us at home. Now, I have a bit of a confession to tell you all. I am more tired this morning than I have been since my baby daughter was born three years ago. I'm running on caffeine. It's because of a decision we made as a family four months ago when this pandemic was really starting to get serious. Uh, my wife is a high school teacher, so she was home a little bit more than normal, and, and our three-year-old were trying to teach her how to be responsible. And so we made the decision to do what many families decided to do during this pandemic and put a deposit down on a black Labrador puppy. So that was four months ago, and put the deposit down, then the waiting game happens, right? You're waiting for the birth of the puppy. Has that happened about two weeks? Oh, this is him. So that's Brooklyn, named after the Brooklyn Dodgers. Our other dog is Kershaw, so you might know a theme. I'm thinking of getting nine dogs for the full roster, but uh, we'll see if Jess lets me. Uh, anyway, so uh, with four months to wait for this gift that we were so excited to get, and then uh, after they were born about two months ago, we, saw the, we just looked every week for the pictures that the breeder would send us, and then there was another two-week-long waiting game, or two-month-long waiting game, and my, my daughter doesn't have a ton of patience. She was dying to get to meet Brooklyn, and then finally the day happened, and for some reason, I, I picked the Friday before preaching to pick up a brand new puppy. Not the smartest decision ever, so we've been up with crying dog the last two nights. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun, but I'm reminded, and I forgot how much responsibility goes into caring for a puppy. When you're given this gift, you've, you've got to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning to take it outside, to go to the bathroom, right? And, I mean, you don't have to be responsible, I guess. You, but if you're not responsible, there's going to be some consequences that happen. Your floor is going to look very different if you stop potty training, right? You're, if you stop the chewing habits, your, your furniture is going to look different. So we had been waiting so long, but now that we have this puppy... We have got to be responsible to steward this gift we've been given, to care for it. We've been in this uh, series of Joshua for a long time, and it's the ultimate culmination of a promise that they've been waiting for. And that promise is the gift of the promised land, right? In the last three weeks, we've been talking about when they finally were able to get this land. Two weeks ago, Mike talked about the land as inheritance. Last week, Pastor Martha talked about the meaning of the land and, and what that means for us. And uh, today we're going to be looking uh, at the allocation of lands and then the responsibility that came with caring for the land that was given to the Israelites. So we're going to start in Joshua 19 today. Now, this is the allocation of land to the tribes. And it really begins at the second half of chapter 18 where the first lot was thrown for the first allocation of land. And that was for the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, and then we're going to start with the second allotment, which is for Simeon. Here we go. The second lot came out for the tribe of Simeon according to its clans. Their inheritance lay within the territory of Judah. It included Beersheba or Sheba, Moladah, Hazar Shual, Bela, Ezim, Eltolad, Bethul, Horma, Ziklag, that's my favorite one, Beth Markaboth, Hazar Susa, Beth Lebaoth, and Sharuhin, 13 towns and their villages. We're going to skip down for obvious reasons to 8b. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the Simeonites according to its clans. The inheritance of the Simeonites was taken from the share of Judah because Judah's portion was more than they needed. So the Simeonites received their inheritance within the territory of Judah. That's significant. We'll come back to that. The third lot came up for Zebulun according to its clans. And we'll skip down. There were 12 towns in their villages. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of Zebulun according to its clans. The fourth lot came out for Issachar. Issachar, according to its clans, their territory included, then it lists the territory, down to 22b. There were 16 towns in their villages. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Issachar, according to its clans. The fifth lot came out for the tribe of Asher, according to its clans. Their territory included, then it lists the territory. 30b, there were 22 towns in their villages. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Asher, according to its clans. 
The sixth lot came out for Nephtali according to its clans. There were 19 towns in their villages. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Nephtali according to its clans. In the last lot, the seventh lot came out for the tribe of Dan according to its clans. Their territory included their inheritance. It lists them. Verse 48, these towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Dan according to its clans. Now when they had finished dividing the land into its allotted portions, the Israelites gave Joshua son of Nun an inheritance among them, as the Lord had commanded. They gave him the town he asked for, Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim. And they built up the town and settled there. These are the territories of Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel, assigned by Lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And so they finished dividing the land. <sighs> The word of the Lord. Now I know all of you felt like that was the most riveting thing you've heard, right? As we read that. I'll be honest, I, just confession, usually when I go through Joshua in my own private devotion time, sometimes I hit chapter 12 and just skip right on to Judges because that's a lot to, you know, to read continuously. Uh, in fact, when I was first given this scripture, I was with Pastor Mike, we were sitting out in the cafe, and I read it and I chuckled just like you did. And I said, Mike, do you and Aaron sit in the office and when you're giving out the sermons go, Mike, do you want that one? No, I, I, give it to Rob. <laughs> and he said, he assured me that that doesn't happen. But there are uh, actually several things in here that are fascinating and worth noting. One is subtle, but has massive implications for how we understand the grace and redemptive work of God. And the second piece jumps off the page. So we're going to look at the subtle piece. It was the line in Simeon's allocation. The line says that the inheritance lay within the territory of Judah. Now here's a map of the 12 different lands that had eventually been allocated. You can't see it very well, but right at the bottom you see Judah. In the middle of it, you see Simeon. In in the text, Simeon is the only tribe that wasn't given boundaries. Instead, they were just given some cities within the tribe of Judah. Now how does this happen? Well, the, the way that they figured out the allotment wasn't just by casting lots and praying at Shiloh. It actually has correlation to Genesis 49. Jacob's blessing to his sons is really how the allocation of the land ended up being played out. Uh, we don't need to show yet, but... Um, so I want you to picture Jacob with his 12 sons, who later became the 12 tribes of Israel. He had one daughter named Dina. And he's sitting down with his sons, and he's giving them this one final blessing. Now, I want you to imagine that you are Simeon, or you are his brother Levi, and you're receiving this final blessing from your father, Jacob. Okay, here we go. Genesis 49, verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers, Jacob is speaking. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger, so fierce, and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Well, thanks for that blessing, Dad. I imagine they must have been a little concerned. And compare that to their brother's blessing, Judah, verse 8. Well, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies, and your father's sons will bow down to you. I don't know if I'd call, I'm sure that uh, Levi and his brother wouldn't have thought, Simeon wouldn't have thought that that was a heck of a blessing from their father, right? Now, what happened was uh, back in Genesis 34, there's a reason for Jacob giving this blessing to his sons. And Genesis 34 is a tragic story that I don't have time to get into, but something happened to their little sister Dina, and in rage, they basically went and massacred an entire town. And uh, Jacob was upset by that. The, The Simeon and Levi probably felt like they were justified, but now they're given this fate. You're cursed. You're going to be scattered throughout all Israel. Judah, on the other hand, you're going you're to get it good. Your brothers are going to bow down to you. But what we are reminded of in Joshua, in the whole Old Testament in particular, is that no bad fate in the Old Testament is a permanent fate. No bad fate is a permanent fate. We see this theme over and over in the Old Testament of the people falling, given, falling, given a fate, but then God coming in and giving grace and redemption within that. You know, I think a lot of times we have two different images of God in our head. We have the God of the Old Testament, we have the God of the New Testament. We have the God in the New Testament who is full of grace 
and love and compassion and tenderness. And then we have images of the God of the Old Testament being wrathful and vengeful and angry. You, it's a common phrase. The God, that's an Old Testament God kind of move, right? But if you were to actually sit down and read the Old Testament from beginning to end, I think you would have a very hard time coming to the conclusion that the God of the Old Testament is anything but a God of immense grace. Because over and over again, the story of the Old Testament is God choosing his people and caring for them and giving them a gift, and they squander that gift and they turn their back on him and he forgives them and lifts them up. It's the story of the Old Testament, friends. Look at Judges. Every single chapter in Judges is that exact same story. They're given blessing, they turn their backs on God, they do evil, they repent, God gives them a deliverer called the judge, and the cycle repeats in chapter two, three, four, five. In the Old Testament, we see a God of grace and redemption. And here with Simeon, that land, no, Simeon didn't have borders, but within that territory of Judah that he gave Simeon, those were the best towns in Judah. They were the best ones that Simeon got. Within the territory of the brother he's supposed to bow down to. Jerusalem was not yet in Judah, it was in Benjamin at the time. But you see God giving grace, but then there is this redeeming of his story. Levi Levi gets to be the tribe of priests to represent God before his people. God is in the business of forgiveness and rewriting our stories. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but God is a God of grace, and if you are in need of grace, he is at work redeeming your story right now. So that's the first thing that pops out. The second thing that pops out is the repeated phrase that you probably got sick of me saying over and over and over again. It says, these towns and villages were the inheritance of the tribe of, tribal name, according to its clans. Now, we can't have an honest conversation about land unless we talk about it as land as inheritance. And they were given this inheritance, they were given this gift, and they were expected to steward this gift. Now, what does stewardship of land look like for them? Stewardship of this gift. It's adherence to the Torah adherence to the law. God made an agreement with them. I'm going to give you this gift, but you need to follow the Torah. You need to adhere to it. Now, the Torah may seem very long. It's the first five books of the Old Testament. It's really the law is the way to think of it. And Jesus, luckily, uh, a guy we can take at his word, sums up the law in two phrases. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's strict adherence to the Torah. Now, Mike showed uh, a video from the Bible Project two years ago when he was talking about uh, uh, the land as inheritance. Here's, here's one of the pieces. So faithfulness to the Torah meant life and blessings in the land, but unfaithfulness meant j- divine justice and exile. Well, the people were given this gift. They are expected to steward this gift, to be faithful to the Torah, but here's the thing. Love the Lord your God. They made images of other gods and worshiped them. They turned their back on the one who delivered them and gave them this gift. Love your neighbor as yourself. They did not do that well. If you've not read the book of Amos, it is a convicting book. But Amos comes in to tell them, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not loving the Lord. You're not loving your neighbor. And it is hard to read because, frankly, there are implications today when you read Amos. And so they get led into exile. Babylon conquers them, brings them to Babylon, and you still have prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah during the exile period, telling them why this happened, because you didn't observe the Torah, you did not love God, and you did not love people. But again, we're reminded in the Old Testament, no fate is permanent fate, and God is in the business of redemption. He leads his people out of exile, allows them to rebuild the temple, and we know the ultimate picture of redemption is God coming to earth in the person of Jesus to include us in the story. Well, we today have been given the same responsibility to steward our own inheritance. Our inheritance is not land, but it's twofold. It's Jesus Christ, and it's the kingdom of God. Now I want to define kingdom a little bit, because I think imagery can get confusing here. I want you to picture heaven as a reality. Heaven is, is is God's kingdom, is the kingdom of God. Now, when we think of heaven as inheritance, that's something a lot of us understand really well. That we get our inheritance when we move into heaven someday out in the future. And that's why we use terms like saved. 
Well, now I'm a Christian, so I, I, I am living in this world that I'm in, but I'm not of. But one day, I get to take my inheritance and walk into it. But the kingdom of God is so much bigger than a future inheritance. Jesus himself said that the kingdom has arrived here with me. And we are called to steward God's kingdom here on earth. Now, there's a story that helps us think about what does it look like and what does it not look like to steward God's kingdom. And Lisa read that for us. It's a parable from Jesus. And just to recap a little bit, this, uh, this man goes to Jesus and says, uh, Teacher, make my brother give me uh, my share of the inheritance. And it's common for that actually to happen. People would go to rabbis to deal with inheritance disputes because, again, they were experts on the law and they would help with those issues. But Jesus sees a motive of greed. And he doesn't want any part of it. So instead of settling the dispute, he tells a story, a story about a man who had this plot of land and looks at his land, and one year it has a plentiful harvest. And we notice a stylistic feature as Jesus is talking that the man is speaking in only first-person singular verbs over and over and over again. He's going, uh, my land produced, my grain my storehouses aren't big enough to hold all this stuff, so I need a big, bigger storehouses to hold my wealth. What am I going to do with my stuff? How can I help prolong my life? He's focused on my. So God's response, you're dead. Now what are you going to do with all your wealth? What are you going to do with all your stuff? This man did not steward his kingdom responsibility to put the needs of others above his own. So as we think about inheritance, the question I've been asking myself this week that I want to invite you into is, do we think of anything as mine, even as it relates to faith? My God, my faith, my church, my worship service, my kingdom. I fear that when we start thinking in terms of that same first person singular verb of of preserving myself, that we can get into that thinking of no longer is it just my God, but now it's my kingdom. But there's no room for I in the kingdom. There's no room for mine in the kingdom. And I fear that when we begin to think that way about my faith, my God, my worship, that we can slide into what this man was dealing with, my house. My money that I worked hard for, that I built, my inheritance, my house, my car, my boat, my family, my spouse, my kids, and the kingdom, none of that is ours. Not when we're stewarding it correctly. My house is Jesus' house. So the question we have to ask is how does this purchase of my house affect and steward the kingdom of God here today? When I want to buy my car, how is that car used for expanding the kingdom, even within our own families? It's not my life, it's God's life. So how do I live my life stewarding the kingdom? It's not my spouse, she belongs to Jesus. I don't have ownership over her. So how do we walk hand in hand building the kingdom together? My child... It's not my child. God has given this precious three-year-old on loan to me to love and to steward and prepare her for her own kingdom work as she gets older. Because the reality is, when we don't steward things in the kingdom way, and instead we're stewarding things for our kingdom, there are massive consequences. And it's that That phrase, my kingdom, a lot of destruction tends to happen in our world at the hands of Christians pushing their kingdom and not God's kingdom. And in the name of Jesus, we see massive injustices happen throughout history because people are pushing my kingdom instead of the kingdom. And we cannot be about that as Christians. We have to be about the kingdom of God and stewarding that. One phrase I hear all the time, especially lately, is, well, one day God's just going to fix everything. That's a cop-out. That's a way to step out of stewardship. I know it's easy to say. 
I, my morning routine, friends, is I sit on the back patio, I have my quiet time, then I, no, no, I'm sorry, I read the news, then I need my quiet time. And I read the news and I'm disheartened at the world because it's a tragic story of people pursuing their kingdoms and not the kingdom of God. And it's easy for me to sit back and go, Lord, I'm just gonna pray because nothing's gonna get fixed until you come back, so I'm gonna pray for you to come back. That's not wrong to pray for God to fix things, but God has invited you into the process of change to steward God's kingdom. And I know it's easy to think that me as an individual can't possibly make a difference in stewarding the kingdom of God in this world, but if we think that, that is an insult to the Holy Spirit within you. Because it is God who resides in you and God who can work through you to create change to establish his kingdom. You are created in the image of God to be agents of his kingdom. To bring justice where there's injustice, to bring hope where there is no hope, to bring love where there is no love. That is what we are called to do. God has invited you on an adventure that is a journey of establishing his kingdom here on earth and he is going before you to do that. We're invited into the process. So how do we actually steward our inheritance? I'm gonna offer two practical suggestions. Number one, remember that this is about Jesus and his kingdom. This is not about pursuit of any political ideology. This is simply about seeing the world through the eyes of this. Thinking theologically about everything that we do not picking and choosing, and not having this savior complex that I'm gonna be the one to change the world. No, we fix our eyes on Jesus and we pursue his kingdom that he's working to establish here as we wait for it to come to full reality one day. Number two, don't disengage from the kingdom work because it's hard. This is difficult stuff, friends. It is easy to become overwhelmed at the brokenness of the world around us, and it's also really hard to do inner work that, take, that it takes to be agents of God's kingdom. But when it gets difficult, lean into God and ask for him to mold you, because he's the one doing that. I'm gonna end with this, a word on grace. A reminder That what we saw in Joshua, what we've seen in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God is a God of grace and redemption. Not one of you, and not me, or anybody watching at home, are going to steward the kingdom life perfectly. None of us are, and we can't be too hard on ourselves because of that. Because the Lord is in the process of redeeming your story to make you a greater agent of his for kingdom work. But walk in that grace. Only Christ perfectly carried out the mission to bring the kingdom. We just get to be as little kids as we follow him in that process, but we're surrounded by grace and he's redeeming our story. You've been given a gift. That gift is the Holy Spirit. You are made in God's image to steward the kingdom. Let's pray. Mm. Lord Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is and as one day will be in heaven. Father, give us the courage to lean into stewardship of that kingdom, to lean into your Holy Spirit's guidance within us, to do the hard work that it takes, to follow your lead to build your kingdom here on earth. Lord, give us grace and give us your eyes. We pray in your name, amen.